Thank you, Leah, and welcome uh, to many of you, and welcome back to Alex Kryline. Where is he? I'm right here. Um, uh, there's something called Team Harmon, and the way we talk about this is you can join any time you want, but you can never leave. <laughs> and Alex is a, for better or worse, he looked a little better when he worked on the Hill, so much. Uh, a <laughs> member of uh, Team Harmon. Um, uh, I also want to thank those. Uh, are there some who are attending this discussion or watching it via streaming webcast? Yes. 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 Hello to all of you out there in the ether. Um, that's a technology option, not that anyone's missed it, not available to all of America's first responders. Those would be the people who are, are tasked with keeping us safe in the event of a natural or, or, or man-made uh, 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 problem. Um, I am passionate about the subject of uh, uh, interoperable communications. I spent a lot of my time uh, during 17 years in Congress, that would be 119 dog years. Uh, it was long service, uh, worried about this problem. And uh, I especially had nightmares, as I'm sure you did, about the fact that NYPD helicopters were circling uh, the trade towers, which were glowing red. Uh, while uh, firefighters were going up the stairs, and there was no way to tell these people that they were, uh, they and the people at the higher floors were on a death march. It was a horrific tragedy that hopefully we will avoid again. Um, I authored legislation uh, to deal with this po uh, problem and to do some of the things you're going to talk about today, which is, which are to push technology so that we would have uh, better equipment and with Alex's help. Um, we kept pushing. Uh, we never succeeded um, in, 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 in getting this done, but we kept pushing. And uh, I know that there are significant advances in technology since 9-11. I also, uh, and you also have been watching this fight over spectrum. So the building blocks are in place to fix this problem, but the political will has not yet been found to get it fixed. And I don't think you can get that done uh, today, but I know you can talk about the at least the science and technology aspects of this and whether or not um, this wonderful nonpartisan convening space called the Wilson Center can partner with you to try to uh, push the ball uh, further. So um, we are making some progress. I want to com commend uh, Director Essid for uh, his work in training first responders and uh, developing emergency communications plans we've met in the past uh, on these issues. Uh, and I know that your office is providing uh, help to uh, both Congress and the Obama administration uh, in trying to work toward uh, na nationwide public safety wireless broadband network. Um, with a new network comes a new opportunity. And uh, I'm aware that uh, the Science and Technology Project has partnered with the National Alliance for Public Safety, uh, our program on the uh, America and the Global Economy, and the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Emergency Communications to co-host this event. So thank you all, and thanks to Kent Hughes, Peter O'Rourke, Rebecca Harned, Emily Early, and of course to um, um, my team member uh, for helping uh, uh, put this event on. So uh, I would hope that uh, the next time we have this event in these spaces, we would break out the champagne and celebrate success. This is a, an area where success is actually possible. This is not Afghanistan, and it's <laughs> not a number of the other programs we're addressing. This is a, uh, a program that has a logical outcome and the building blocks to get there. So let me turn this over to Peter O'Rourke to introduce our panelists, and thank you again for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Director Harmon. Uh, before we get into the panel, just to give, uh, I'd like to give everyone a little bit of background about what the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is. Uh, we're a not-for-profit foundation, a 501c3. 
uh, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are a practitioner-led organization, so our board members are mostly active duty or retired public safety officials. Uh, they are representative of, of multiple disciplines, so it's uh, not just fire, not just law enforcement, not just public health, emergency management. We, uh, we try to cover as broad a public safety spectrum as we can, and, and we really focus on interdisciplinary cooperation. Um, the organization is, is really the guiding principles are to bring resources to the field to help public safety practitioners deal with the issues that they're facing from a geospatial data perspective, GIS data perspective, um, d data sharing perspective, uh, and, and really then conversely bringing the experiences from the field to the federal government, to the private sector, to those that might benefit from the um, the, the thoughts, perspectives, and experiences of, of local, county, state, and other public safety officials. Um, this forum today is intended to be a, a really a neutral playing field, a neutral um, uh, ground for us to talk about some, uh, as Director Harmon said, certainly achievable issues, but complex issues. Um, where we've asked the public, se I'm sorry, the private sector to provide their thoughts today. Um, and I think this should be a robust and, and, and highly educational uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank very much the Wilson Center for hosting us and for all the efforts they put in. Uh, without organizations like the Wilson Center, our organization would not be effective in our ability to communicate. Uh, so we thank you very much to Leah and to Director Harmon, to the, to the broader Wilson Center staff. Um, with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Morgan Wright. And Morgan, please uh, introduce yourself and the panel. Thank you. Hey, welcome, everybody. My name is Morgan Wright. I'm the vice president at Alcatel Lucent. I'm in charge of the uh, public safety LTE. And I came to this. You're either going to regret this or like this, Peter. So I'm going to try and make sure that you enjoy this when we're done. But uh, I get to moderate today. So I have a very distinguished panel here. Uh, to my left, Bill Mayhew from Qualcomm. Uh, and I had to make sure I spelled the name right and pronounced it right with Bronwyn Agrios from Esri, Rick Sack from Microsoft, and Director Director Esed. He was formally promoted at a Nipstick meeting a while back, so I have to refer to him as his most exaltedness. Um, <laughs> I know Chris, so it's, it's okay, but I want to welcome everybody. Uh, <clears throat> you, you laugh, Alex, but I know Alex well, too, and I have some stories about him and his scooter nope. on the way over. I have pictures <laughs> he, in his bro suit and his scooter on the way over, yes. So. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. but I, uh, uh, I spent 18 years in public safety in the great state of Kansas is where I started. So when you talk about lack of infrastructure, uh, nothing out there. I was joking with them, but I said when I first graduated the Patrol Academy, I had a Smith & Wesson 686, a pair of ammo dumps. I had to reload my weapon one round at a time, yes, like Barney. And I had a pair of handcuffs, and that was the extent of my technology. When I got out, I had no handheld radio. When I stopped vehicles, I had to flip on my outside speaker, walk up, and hope that they didn't give me the news that the person was wanted, the car was stolen, because then it would alert them. So, I mean, I've watched this evolution of technology, and being in the Reagan building on 9-11, and walking across the bridge and seeing the smoke coming up out of the Pentagon had a very profound effect on me because, as I joke, but I'm serious, you cut me, I bleed blue. I'm still a cop at heart. I believe what we do here is important and that we're here to protect and defend this nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So when you take the oath, you know, most people in federal service, that's what they do. So I've got the privilege of actually coming in and being able to moderate and bring people together. And I just want to kind of set the stage for what it is we're going to talk about. So this is talking about how will the public safety broadband the new LTE, the new 4G network, how will it transform? How will, what new things will we enable for public safety? And my view of this, so I get to give just a, a minute of my view to help kind of uh, formulate this, but um, when I looked at this, I looked at it as a distinct problem. We were discriminating against the fixed, between the fixed and the mobile environments. And in the fixed environment, just like today, you have the best of everything. You've got the power coming in. You've got the walls, the building. You've got the bandwidth. You've got the applications. You've got the screen. You have everything you need to do your job there. And don't get me wrong, my wife was a dispatcher for 21 years. But trust me, I appreciate the job the people in the fixed environment do. But it's the people in the mobile environment whose personal safety is at greatest risk. Your firefighters, your police officers, your paramedics, your first responders, the people showing up to the scene, they had the least access to information, the least access to technology. And Director Harmon, when you're talking about the inability for the, the helicopter to give that information, do you guys remember when Captain Sully landed his plane in the Hudson? The first picture to make it out was over to Twitter, and it went to a million people around the world before it got to the OEC in New York City. I mean, we have to change that. So that's part of why we're here today. 
So what I'd like to do is, is as we frame this up, think about a world where there's no fixed or mobile environment, but instead we have a single environment. And we have a unified experience regardless of location, regardless of device. Let's start focusing on the job people do and the tools we want to bring to them so they can make decisions at the point of need. Broadband speed at the point of need, how will that change what our panelists are going to talk about today? So what I'm going to do is, this is kind of a lightning round, so everybody gets five minutes. Uh, Director Essett has assured me of the help of Customs and Border Patrol and armed people. If you go past five minutes, we will escort you out of the building. Bill, I like you, but no. So we're going to go down the line, but what I want to do is, is as these companies represent themselves, we're going to do that, then what we're going to do is go into a moderated session where we've got some questions. And if you've got some, uh, if you've got some questions, kind of hold off onto it. We reserve 15 to 20 minutes at the end where we want to bring that in. What we want to do is make sure we accommodate their time and get them through this right now. So what I want to do is, if Bill, if you're ready for a set of slides, we can ready to go to that. So Bill Mayhew, Qualcomm, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Morgan. Um, what I'm going to try and do in a, in a real quick five minutes here is give you uh, a, an idea of what's coming in the wireless world based on the, the chipsets that we're making, what we're, we're doing with the capabilities that are out there, and then I'm going to try and bring a nexus to them as to how those platforms, if you will, or those capabilities can be brought into public safety. Because we often talk about, okay, what are you doing for public safety? Think of the underlying platforms and start to utilize them in, in a fashion that works for public safety. Much like Morgan, I grew up in the public safety world, and when I reached a level where I could finally make changes, I said, I want everything on my communications division, I want everything on my desktop pushed out to a wireless device. And we made some great headway with that. And my goal was I want to be able to launch a space shuttle from my phone. Um, and 10 years ago, that was kind of a ha-ha that'll never happen. Today, with the power behind the chipset, you're getting pretty close to what you can do. So if we can go to the next slide. What's happening with the chipsets? This phone, these devices, the chipsets that are beyond, behind them are becoming extremely powerful. They're multi-mode. They interact with all different types of network. They can jump from different types of networks. So when we think of one network and saying we want to push video out to uh, uh, the first responders or bring first responders video back to the command post and we only have the wireless network of a, a cellular wireless network, that may not be the case. We may also be able to use Wi-Fi. We may be able to use Bluetooth in some instances. So multi-mode, multi-capability, multi-radios within the devices um, become very important as to how we can use them. Um, discovering things, discovering things that are relevant to you. What is out there? If I'm a firefighter, where are the fire hydrants? Where are the power boxes? Um, what else can I find from a building? Where are the people inside the building? Because their wireless devices can talk to the other wireless <coughs> devices that are there. All those things are capable, built within the chipsets that are there. Uh, sensors, various sensors built into the phone and various sensors that can be attached to the phone. How about nuke, chem, biosensors built into the phone so that we can then start taking plume models uh, of an incident or an area and start projecting out. DHS has done that. That was one of the things that we were able to do and put chemical sensors into a phone and show that that could work and then start to aggregate that information and push it back out to the users in the field to give them plume modeling as to where they need to go or not go to do things filters so we can in, in, include what we want to see, what we don't want to see, or have people as security measures all built into the devices now. So extremely powerful chipsets are coming out. Next slide. Are we up? Okay. Augmented reality. Um, you hear about that. That's a, everybody thinks of it as a gaming application. Think of it as a platform that's out there, as what we can do with that. Imagine, I mean, in San Diego, what would happen when the cops would chase the robbers? The robbers would crash the car, they'd bail out, and they'd run into a canyon. And at first, the cops would chase the bad guy into the canyon, and they'd realize this is pretty dangerous. We'll come up with a better process. We're going to surround the canyon. Now we're surrounding the canyon and thinking, okay, one of us has got to go in there and chase the bad guy out. So we find the guy with the lowest ID number and send him into the canyon, <laughs> and he would chase the bad guy. I thought you were about to say IQ. <laughs> 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 Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> then with the advent of canines, we'd take the canines and send the canine in, but the handler would always have to hang on to the canine until they had an actual ID on the suspect. Got smarter, got more capabilities, started flying helicopters over with Ford looking in for red. Now imagine that being able to take a phone with a camera and showing the, showing the canyon 
with GPS devices enabled on everybody's phone or device that the officers have, now you know where every officer is, one for the canine that comes up as a different icon, all being integrated into one picture set so that you can then have a coordinated effect or a coordinated attack on, on whatever it is you're looking for, whether it's a lost person or a real bad guy. And so everything is becoming, you'll hear this term a lot, we were just talking about internet of everything. The capabilities are there. The wireless capabilities are there. So go back to the example I talked about at the beginning. You have a, a wireless phone, a phone that's sitting out in, in being utilized, sending live video back, but not sending it over the commercial network, not sending it even over the public safety network, using, <coughs> using a Wi-Fi to send it directly to the TV so that then the TV can then send it out. You're not eating up your bandwidth. Things of that, medical devices. There are uh, Band-Aids out there now that can do um, uh, pulse rate, um, respiratory rate, blood pressure that you can throw on a patient. So imagine a triage situation where you have multiple people down, you take a picture of the person, you put a Band-Aid on them, you associate that Band-Aid with the picture that you just took, they know the location that that person came from, and then you can send that information to the hospital so that they can end up at the right hospital so that you have the correct medical team uh, being utilized in the most efficient fashion. If you've ever been in a situation where you've seen that, um, finding victims, parents, loved ones, trying to figure out which hospital their, their loved one is at, that can be a traumatic situation, let alone having the information uh, quickly, the medical information quickly to know that it's a, a serious injury or not so serious injury, and being able to get that to the appropriate authority so that they can have uh, the resources available to act on it when they get it. So how does that bring back into what Morgan was talking about? When we go to the next slide. We've talked about the broadband wireless network. But for the most part, when we've talked about it, the only thing, and I apologize <coughs> for this being kind of an eyesore chart, but for the most part, when we've talked about it, we've only talked about that centerpiece down at the bottom that says terrestrial network, wireless infrastructure. Um, because that's what really the network everybody thinks about is. Um, where we haven't what we haven't spoken of is the, the two other ends of this, and there's really a lot of ends to this. Um, and when we want to try and influence the industry, it's really a whole ecosystem. It's not just the guys who are putting in the infrastructure. It's the users at the other end. What information do they want to get and be able to aggregate? What kind of processing power do you need in your chipsets to be able to do that? Do you want GPS in there? What type of radios do you want in there? Um, how many DSPs do you need in the chipset? What type of information are you going to try and do and uh, analyze on the edge? Because there's a lot of stuff with the processing power that you can do now. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, the, a lot of uh, capabilities you can do now at the edge of the network, in other words, at the edge of the device, and use that device for analytical capabilities. So you don't have to use the network to be able to do that. Um, what kind of devices do you want? Do you want just a dongle that's sitting in the back of a car, or do you want a camera, do you want a phone, uh, do you want an, a, a, a pad of some sort uh, for the users to be able to do? All those are critical parts of the whole ecosystem that we still need to talk about to figure out what this n whole network is going to look like. And I'll stop there. Senator, and we'll get more time with everybody uh, a little bit later. So real quickly, is there anybody who's not familiar when we talk about the public safety broadband network? Does everybody have a pretty good idea of what we're talking about here? You know, that there's 10 megahertz currently assigned. There's, there's legislation in Congress to allocate the other 10 megahertz to build out a true nationwide public safety broadband network. So that's with Bill's comments and, and now Bronwyn's comments we're kind of targeting towards. So, Bronwyn, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Don't worry. I, I don't have five minutes, so I'll, I'll give you some more of your You're time entitled back. to your full five minutes. This is Washington, D.C. You're entitled to your time. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm Bronwyn Agrios from Esri and uh, talked a little bit today uh, about the, um, the use of GIS spatial data within um, the crowdsourcing environment for emergency management. And you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Oh, you can get me on Twitter if you want. <laughs> if I'm on my phone today, it's because I'm tweeting whatever, all the great stuff everybody's saying. Uh, so just to provide a little context of, of kind of where Esri plays in this, in this community, um, we have a a large group of, of great users and partners who participate in the public safety uh, public safety arena, and um, we assist uh, a lot of time with these with our customers and users when they're in a, an emergency or crisis situation, 
through the Esri Disaster Response Program. And this is my little pitch to tell you guys about this program. To uh, the, our goal with with this program is to provide you with you know software licenses with uh, with data. We have got a team of people who can hound down great data sets for you. You know if you're in the case where you know a tornado is hit because um, you're busy doing other things, uh, we can build applications, get you connected, and um, this this program is really meant to help you know support our users and our and our partners in times of need. So. A lot of the time when I'm working with our customers during these crisis times, more and more frequently, this comes into the conversation. We want to tap into the social media. We want to find out what the community is saying, but we don't know how, or we don't know, uh, we don't know what value we're going to get from it. So my work at Esri is primarily focused on trying to answer those questions, um, doing the R&D surrounding, you know, actually adding value to social media, adding value to that crowdsourced content um, because there's such a wealth fit out there. Um, probably flip, flip to the next slide. So mm -hmm. I guess the, one of the roots of this conversation is that um, kind of a, as Bill said, everybody, you know, everybody's got one of these in their pocket now, right? More technology, more connectivity than we've ever had as consumers. We have uh, more technology at our fingertips than now than we had in our offices five years ago. And what this is doing is creating what in the IT world we're calling big data, right? Data that uh, is high volume, high velocity, <coughs> complex, diverse data, and more than we've ever seen before. Right, I mean, all that's in the consumer space. How do we bring that into uh, the enterprise? so that it can help us make better business decisions, increase our business intelligence. Um, I think I have a couple animations in there. You can probably just, just hit next. You can hit next again, yeah. The, so in my experience with working with crowdsourced data and social media is that we kind of started a couple of years ago with putting some tweets on a map and we thought, hey, cool. You know, social, social media on a map. Uh, and then we realized, well, that's not especially, you know, it's not especially valuable just to see a couple of tweets on a map or see a couple of Flickr photos on a map. Um, what can we actually do to make this a valuable resource? And the connection that we had to just the public, you know, public Twitter stream wasn't really cutting it. So we realized we need to access that big fire hose of big data that's coming in from from the consumer space and filter it down, do some spatial analysis, and so we can do things like, uh, you know, density analysis of where people are communicating. <coughs> if we can say there is, you know, a, a hot spot of tweets and photos coming from this plaza, maybe there is, um, you know, maybe there's a riot that started up there in a time of unrest. Maybe we can say that a hot spot um, of tweets coming from this building, actually geolocated to this building, show that, you know, in a, in a, after an earthquake that people are actually trapped here. So <clears throat> these types of questions we're trying to answer with uh, some of the research we're doing and some of the challenges, which I'm sure are going to come up throughout this conversation, that we've, that we've identified are things like only about 3% of people tweet with, uh, with geo turned on. Um, Rare, again, I'm seeing a lot of heads shaking. Rarely do people tweet with, with their, with their, with geo enabled because, oh, really? Yeah, you're going fast, you're doing good. Uh, because we don't want people following us, right? So what can we do in the public safety world to increase the awareness of just how important it is to add geospatial to your messages, uh, especially in a time of crisis? Things like um, when evacuations happen, we set up shelters, maybe, create a big sign when I walk into that shelter telling somebody to tweet this hashtag, you know, a unique hashtag, so that on the public safety side, whenever I see that hashtag, it doesn't matter if they have location turned on. I know where they are because they've given me that unique identifier. Um, obviously more, but I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. So th there's lots of good stuff. Don't worry, guys. We're going to get into to more of this. So, uh, so Rick Zach, Microsoft. Yeah. 
Oh, I thought there was a question coming. Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> Did you want me to ask you a question? Well, I was going to get the I was going to ask you where your right? iPad was, but, but I thought that would no. be a little bit too uh, tough on you, man. <laughs> all friends here, Morgan. <laughs> we were. Fire, firefighter cop. We that's, just had this natural thing going on. I, I think that's an interesting thing to highlight, too, is we, we – I met Morgan and I instantly loved him and hated him at the same time. And it took a while to figure out that in my background, I'm a firefighter and he's a cop. I said, well, it makes perfect sense. Well, all you right? all need heroes too, so that's so, why we're here, yes. But I felt the you. same way if it, if it means anything. Oh, to well, that's sweet of you. Uh, so, uh, you know, the background for me coming into this panel today is in some ways is the background of Microsoft's. Uh, participation in the world of justice and public safety. And it's not just because the, the other side of my background is, is as a firefighter. And as Morgan said, when you see communications issues up close, when you're standing there, and I would just tell you, when you're standing there and you cannot talk to the person from the fire department in the next town, when you're both responding together, you throw up your hands and you say, there's got to be an answer to the question. A little background for, for Microsoft, and I, I, I saw some quizzical looks when, when I was introduced. It was, I got it, Office, Windows. I sort of see what Microsoft does. I don't necessarily see sort of why you're in the chair and not, and not somebody else. And I think it's an interesting bit of background to put on where we play and how we play very often with a lot of the other people that you see on the, on the panel today. And that is, if you started on one end of what Microsoft does, you say it's Windows, it's, it's Office, you start to get to some other interesting things that we do that are around some of our web properties, our new very strong push into things like cloud, um, business applications, and you start to get to some interesting things like games. I have a nephew who thinks that Microsoft makes cool games and boring stuff for grown-ups. Right, so we have a lot of different businesses, and the, the point I really want to uh, highlight in, in the little lightning round is the way that all those things are coming together in different ways to support justice and public safety, but with a couple of core themes tying them together. Um, one is this idea of consolidation, that things are coming together. I think it was Morgan talking about there's different pieces of communications coming together, and now we see them at once. And we look at things like the enabling technologies that Microsoft provides, and we say, well, the line between what you do in your office, what you do in your mobile device, what you consume coming out of one of our cloud data centers, what you consume from somebody else coming through one of our devices or one of our solutions, those lines are all really blurring. And so it's important that that framework sitting behind it that we're having the conversations with our friends from Esri and, and from Qualcomm and uh, even my friend Morgan uh, to make sure that we're tying this together in a way that makes sense because I can, I can give you an example of, all right, we, we work with our customers. We do the, the traditional things with our justice and public safety customers. We worry about efficiency and productivity and how can we help you get closer to citizens and a lot of those things. But we do other kinds of things like um, a solution that we develop that we essentially give away to enable first responders to communicate with citizens. And it requires the web as its back end. But we do some things that tie together different pieces of Microsoft, different pieces of I'll defend Twitter. I'll be, the de I'll be the Twitter defender here and saying it is interesting, now teasing Brownwood, it is interesting to put a golf ball on a map with a, with a tweet on it when you can do it in ways that's a low common denominator that says I need to know where somebody, something, some asset is and I can borrow somebody's technology like Twitter, right? Even pump through something that, that we do and I'll probably talk about that a little later. What I want you to walk out saying is that it's about building the right fabric behind a lot of the solutions that come forward to enable the connectivity, the communications, the way people collaborate during a disaster or even during your basic, you know, drive the beat in your patrol car. If we can put the right pieces together in that fabric and have all that connectivity in the back end, then we can do some amazing things that, as Bronwood said five years ago, we'd say, well, you can't do that. And we can do it now. It's very much about getting out of the silos and making sure we've got strong connectivity across the whole spectrum of providers at different places in the value chain. You still have a minute. I'm going to give my minute conditionally to Chris. Uh, <laughs> and I might give it back because I don't think I have five well, minutes. Well, I, I try not to restrict Chris's time because the last time I did, he put me on a do not fly list uh, when I was headed on vacation. So uh, <laughs> There's no proof of that. <laughs> but there is an admission, though. No. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Chris Essid. DHS OEC, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'd like to first thank uh, Director Jane Harmon and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars for sponsoring this event. I think it's great we're all up here. She knows from her time in Congress, as you heard earlier, that this issue is a complex issue, but one that we can solve by working together. 
Uh, I'd like to also play, thank uh, Peter O'Rourke uh, from the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation for their support of this panel, as well as their support for the uh, public safety community. So I'm the director of this small little office within DHS called the Office of Emergency Communications. And prior to that, I did this at the state level in Virginia as the interoperability coordinator in the governor's office. And I can assure you that uh, through these experiences, interoperable communications is just as much about bringing people together as it is about the technologies we're discussing. We need to do both. They're both critical. And that's why our office brings people together, our stakeholders in the emergency response community, to develop policies and things of that nature moving forward. They're our customer. And so over the last few years, uh, you know, we've got this straight stakeholder-driven approach that's yielded a lot of great successes. I'll just list a few. The first one is we developed the National Emergency Communications Plan together as a community, the federal um, stakeholders working with state and local stakeholders, uh, working with industry. And so that's the uh, nation's first strategic plan to improve emergency communications, and we're currently working on the update. We've implemented a lot of things in that plan also. We've made some great progress. Every state now has a statewide plan for this issue. When we first started, there were five. Now everyone has it, and they've updated it several times. We've uh, strategically aligned a lot of our service offerings, like technical assistance and other direct service offerings, to those strategic plans, so states now are prioritizing themselves what they need the help with. Before those plans were there, there was really nothing to prioritize against. It makes sense. We've developed a uh, what we call COML training program. It's communications unit leader, and in an incident, these are the people that set up communications and help uh, set up communications in an incident. We've trained over 3,500 of them across the country, and the number's growing every week. So, so now we're on the verge of this historic and exciting time for public safety where there's all this new technology uh, and resources that are providing capabilities as uh, the other panelists talked about, where just one day they were just dreams. You know, everyone dreamed of having this stuff. Never before have there been so many tools for public safety to use and to aid them in the protecting the communities uh, that they serve. These technolo technological advancements have made the commercial sector over the last 10 years uh, just invaluable to public safety. Th these are very impressive uh, movements and, and um, developments. We've succeeded in connecting most of the world to the Internet and putting the power of the computer in the palm of your hand, as we talked about. We've tons of devices. We could hold up 30 of them. But within the same decade, we failed to address the most pressing national, one of our pressing national security risks, the construction of a nationwide interoperable wireless broadband network to serve public safety. Uh, public safety voice communications today, it continues to operate on technologies that were developed in the 1930s. Think about that. I said the 1930s. Yeah. That's right. I just wanted to let that sink in. Um, you know, and, and data communications continue to operate on commercial networks that have great offerings, but for public safety, it's got to work everywhere all the time because they don't just say, hey, what you doing? A lot of times they're exchanging data in life or death situations. And so it's got to be bulletproof. It's got to work all the time. And so whatever we develop has to meet the need for public safety. So Congress and the administration are working together to address the fund fundamentals of constructing the network, including the governance structure. Um, but we need to continue to have support from our commercial partners to develop the technology that meets the needs of public safety. Uh, we need, you know, commercial customers are driving innovative technology. We saw the number of users, and I wrote it down uh, from one of the earlier slides. In 2011, 9 billion connected devices. In 2020, the projection is 24 billion. Well, we call that economies of scale in the public safety community. We don't have that today, but we're hoping to leverage that. So you, you, you may have heard uh, public safety officials saying that their 16-year-olds had more technology on these little gadgets than they have to do their jobs. And, you know, you know once we build a reliable nationwide public safety broadband network, this community is going to be able to do the things we've talked about, get building schematics run all types of information from their portable devices, uh, stream live video back to the emergency operations centers or to each other for situational awareness. The sky's the limit. It's fantastic. But industry and public safety together must spark this innovation and must have conversations. I mean, we've got to cooperate with uh, and, and, and partner with uh, our corporations like Microsoft, Qualcomm, Alcatel-Lucent, and Esri. 
and others. I mean, public safety has got to partner with industry like never before in this new environment. This is not land mobile radio. This is a whole new game. And we have to work together as a community. So my office is pursuing ways to connect the innovators in the private sector, uh, many of the people at this event, with professionals in the emergency uh, public safety community so that we can work together to, you all can understand their requirements, they can understand what the technology uh, will afford them, you know, in the future. I mean, it's, it sounds so simplistic, but that's the most difficult thing about this interoperability challenge is getting, getting people together. So, you know, there's not one person in this room, and I don't think there's one person in this nation that doesn't want public safety to have the tools it needs to do its job. I've yet to find one. Nobody wants them to not have what they need. So the future of public safety response depends upon the innovation of the private sector and its ability to work with public safety and public safety working with the private sector like never before. So, you know, we, we've got to continue to partner so that these folks, these heroes around our nation, have the tools they need to do their jobs in your community. So that's all I've got. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you. I'm not on the do not fly list, right? We're okay? I, I don't think you ever were. Okay. I, that was Alex. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I knew. <laughs> I have to tell you a quick story about Alex, too. Is about a year ago, a point of personal privilege, I get to do just a small little bit about our company, but a year ago, we did the first uh, public safety broadband band 14 demonstration ever done, and Alex was out there. He's always been a good uh, friend of ours to do this, but I think one of the important things about doing some of this is we changed the conversation from theoretical to real. Mm -hmm. Now it's real. Now the technology is there. Now what are we going to do? No more, well, what ifs, right? Now it's how do we? What are we going to do? And I'll tell you one of the things I've been encouraged by. Let me tell you, somebody spent a couple years inside justice working on information and intelligence sharing and the tough battles we had. I want to give kudos to, I mean, everybody up here, but especially Chris and his gang, great group of folks, Alex, that have w truly partnered with public safety in ways. That we used to, as a state and local detective and stuff and sharing intelligence, we hated sometimes working with the federal government because it was a one way. We'd throw it over. We wouldn't get anything back. And that also characterized the collaboration and the technology. They had the best, and we didn't have anything sometimes. So we've made great strides. There's still a long ways to go, but, you know, but thanks to everybody up here to do that. Now we're, what we're going to do is we have some questions we've kind of worked on, but we want to tee up some things. This is a little bit more freestyling. Yeah, Alex would like that. We're going to freestyle now, Alex. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, like your hair. We're going to freestyle. So, Drop your um, so Bill, let, let's, let's go to you first. So, um, uh, you know, Qualcomm's been around this for a long time. In fact, you guys were one of the first to bid, in fact, the only to bid on the D block, right? So kind of tell us what's happened since then to where you are now and what you see, like the strategic direction you're taking, well, why not D-Block? But you know, you've talked about a lot of the chips, a lot of the devices. Obviously, the end device, the last mile issues are going to be very key for public safety. So um, what kind of things do you foresee from a visionary standpoint public safety is going to need for this broadband network? Yeah, I th you probably have better luck getting a, a, an Apple guy to let you borrow his iPhone 5 than to get, have me give you the strategy of Qualcomm in regards to things. But um, <laughs> um, let me tell you where we're working at. We're platforms. We spend two and a half billion dollars a year on research and development to take uh, the capabilities in Qualcomm to the next level, to feed the marketplaces so that, that individuals can create uh, uh, applications and capabilities for the users out there. Um, and we do that each and every year. And so whether it be LTE or augmented reality, um, we're doing various platforms across the spectrum and across that. If you think of that ecosystem that's out there, we're trying to reach across that ecosystem to provide platforms so that uh, users, whether they be in public safety um, or in uh, other government entities uh, or for the public, that they can take and leverage those capabilities from that platform level and build uh, the pyramid that they want to work within. Uh, there's been just a tremendous amount of uh, uh, um, efforts that we've done with uh, local, state, local, and federal governments to try and understand what those requirements are, what their needs are, so that we can see more specific to public safety what might be useful, um, where their concerns are, where the vulnerabilities are, um, and, and try and build those into our system. So the more we can do that, the better off we're going to be. The more we understand what those end users need, what those cops in the field need, what those firefighters need in the field, um, the more we're going to be able to expand those platforms so that other developers can take that and move forward. So, you know, and Bronwyn, did you, we were talking, we had actually a very lively debate before we came over here, so we had some good stuff, but you've been focusing a lot on social media, so let me throw out a scenario and kind of see, tell me what you see some of the challenges are. So, um, 
Twitter is actually a great tool. Used a lot of it. You're talking about the, the geotagging and, and the geo and the uh, geolocated social media, where we can actually start getting some intelligence out of the activities, not so much the information, but just the mere fact that it exists. But I know that you've been dealing a lot with public safety, but this brings up a, a kind of a joke we told. It used to be the only thing the FBI and the CIA shared was the letter I in their name. That was a Dennis Miller joke. But that was more about policy than technology. And you, you can't go by a day without reading Police One News where some officer somewhere has inappropriately posted something using Twitter, using social media, posting a picture of a crime scene to a Facebook. What are some of the policy issues you've seen? What do you think are some of the issues that need to be resolved or what do we need to address if we're going to incorporate more social media, especially with GIS, into the public safety environment? A very, very valid question. We are freestyling now, just so you know. <laughs> uh, uh, for me, just, you know, you said a lot of things there, but the thing that stood out there for me is the need for verification. Um, one of the big challenges we've seen from our pub from the public safety community and partners that we deal with is the um, reluctance to deal with, to use social media because it gets out there so quick. Um, Twitter. They can't control it, right? That's something they have right. a hard time controlling. Right. You know, Twitter has an agreement with its customers, and I can't remember how many milliseconds it is now, but it's literally milliseconds. By the time you tweet, it's out there in the public sphere. Um, so there, there is no filtering on, you know, what kind of uh, photo perhaps you've attached to your Flickr, uh, to your sorry, to your to your tweet. Um, other social networks do have some sort of. An oops button, kind of like kind I didn't mean of, to send that. Right. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen YouTube videos, and then when we go back to look at it later, it's being pulled down. So there are there are definitely filtering uh, techniques that you know that, that public social networks have. When I say public social networks, I mean uh, the Twitters, the Instagram, the Flickr, the YouTube. Uh, but they do kind of lack this verification process that local government and public safety kind of need um, to maybe jump ahead a little bit, and I don't know if that really hits on the policy uh, part of your question, but I, I hope it does. Um, what I think we need in the public safety community is more of the, uh, the ability to be able to quickly stand up on our, perhaps even on our own IT infrastructure, a, a crowdsourcing platform. When you say your own IT infrastructure, who are you referring to? ESRI or a public safety's own IT infrastructure? The latter. Okay. The latter. You know, if I am, you know, we, we were talking about the city of, Tus or the city of Joplin mm -hmm. earlier with the tornado. Um, what would have been really beneficial, I think, rather than, you know, relying on the public information coming from Twitter, would be for the, the city of Joplin to be able to have their own bounded, let's say, or curated uh, content over their, over their own social network coming in. And maybe this is a social network that isn't available to the public, it's only a social network that's available to that public safety community. So we we know the information is good, right? And we can, uh, you know, that public safety community isn't necessarily just first responders. It's the first responders and maybe two levels away. So we we get a trusted network of communication that's coming from the community, which is kind of vetted. Um, I think I'd I'd like to see more of that definitely in the short term in response to. Uh, perhaps the need for verification on public social networks? Sure. Trust, trust has always been a huge issue in public safety. Can I trust the information? Can I trust the user who's on the network? Because if I trust the user, I'm supposed to be able to trust the information. So, right, exactly. so Rick, let's go to you for a little. You and I had an interesting discussion around unified communications. Yeah. No, I'm not going to make fun of firefighters. Come on now. <laughs> But we had it. But you know, one of the things that you know, I was so somebody who provides LTE infrastructure, but somebody like who was there when we had nothing. And I, I was with you. I can't remember who was saying that. But my daughter, when she graduated college a couple of years ago, had more access to technology, more collaboration than 95 percent of the first responders do in the United States. You know, and actually, that's a trend we're kind of seeing to where, what you it used to be when I first started, and like you, you remember the years ago, right? Only the only people who could afford the technology was government, right? Now it's the best technology happens to sit a lot in the private hands, right? So we're seeing that with 911. Why can't I text a picture or send a video? Well, we're talking about unified communications. I mean, give us an idea. You and I, you were talking about some of the package, some of the communication we're talking. Yeah. How do you think LTE, when we can truly get broadband, where there's no fixed or mobile environment, there's just the environment now? Yeah. How, because you come from a firefighting background, but look at it from police and fire. How do you think the unified communication, some of the work you're doing in Microsoft, do you think that's a key element? How do you think that'll transform some of the communications and the collaboration that's occurring? Well, I think the 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 bridging there is going to be very important that that getting past the what channel are you on 
element of it is is going to be critical for it. And what you find you're doing now is doing workarounds from a public safety standpoint. And I'll speak from sort of the not just the Microsoft side, but I'll put my fire and emergency management hat on. Uh, and that is, right now, there isn't an effective mechanism for people to be able to help each other. And by people, I mean agencies. So agencies coming in to support each other, law enforcement agencies working on a large issue, um, uh, disaster response agencies, emergency management agencies coming together. There isn't a good way for them to talk to each other. We do the radio fumble, and it's not just the gloves. It's the we can't talk to each other. But what you find is we, until we get to that point, we're bridging in ways um, that use the web and the cloud to sort of fake some of the things that we all want to have happen later in a in a in a network. And I, I can give you an example. Um, we talk about uh, Joplin, uh, Missouri, is a really interesting example. And I'm going to I'm going to praise Chris in in just a moment here for some of the the work that we did in the spring with uh, the FEMA national level exercise. So there was a simulated earthquake in the New Madrid Fault, 150th anniversary, and so eight state enormous um, exercise, but one of the things you run into is this. You've got convoys of things coming from different places, sometimes real, sometimes notional. We've got water coming from Illinois. We're up from Tennessee. We've got medical supplies. So forget radio, right? It's, you're not going to talk to each other. There's not going to be a good way to do this. You, you can't track from the back-end system because a lot of those agencies are running different back-end systems to manage their people, their assets, and everything else. So you're in the what do we do part because when if I have a disaster and I called you to come bring me help, I'm responsible for your assets and people the minute you leave your station, your warehouse, your depot, your yard, wherever. Uh, but I can't, I don't know where you are or what you're doing until you basically show up. So there were, Katrina was an example, where there were convoys, a fuel convoy that was just sort of stuck. It ran out of gas in its own trucks, had no way to tell anybody, so it actually pulled over, you know, parked the Bowser and started fueling itself out of its own, out of its own fuel trucks, but it couldn't tell anybody anything about what was going on. And one of the things that, that we did in, in Joplin sort of as a, in both the national level exercise, the FEMA exercise, and, and, uh, and later in Joplin responding with a team from Missouri, I'll do a shout out for them, it was Missouri's dis uh, disaster medical team was was the team we were directly supporting is we said look we've got these assets coming in and nobody can tell where anybody else is so we don't really have a good operational picture how are we going to solve this problem and it was actually somebody from the Missouri DMAT team a, a guy named Tim Conley who said well look we get this idea of saying let's have a broad cloud way to talk to citizens your your point Brian went about how do we communicate and collaborate with citizens what we actually did was we said why don't we borrow Twitter so we have this portal, we have this map up, and we had everybody turn on geolocation, right? And top and bottom of the hour, just, where are you? Where is the stuff coming, right? And so until we, we want to be able to do that, to go to your question, Morgan, we want that to be sort of native. We want that kind of collaboration to be woven in without having to fake it by saying, I'm looking at a map, it's on my, you know, Microsoft portal, the way the blue golf ball just showed up, and that means here's a convoy and this is the mile marker they're at at the bottom of the hour. So that kind of collaboration and having one operational picture across all agencies, assets, and across time, once we have that back-end communication fabric, we'll think we're in the Stone Ages now when we had to tweet somebody from their mobile device to tell me where their convoy was. So we can get there, but we're going to be bridging a lot until we do. We were just joking about us old-timers who remember Star Trek, you know, back <laughs> in the day and stuff. But Gene Roddenberry was considered, you know, he doesn't, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But yet they do studies on how much of the Star Trek technology has actually come to fruition now. So that's kind of my lead into the question. So now you're Captain Kirk. Chris Essett is now <laughs> Captain Kirk. You're, you're going to boldly go where no director, director, you're director, gone director, before. director, captain. Yeah. Give, give, give me the Chris Essett view five years from now. If you had your way and you had the authority to make this happen, how would the public safety environment look? How would you leverage voice and data? How would you change based on it? You guys have done so much work with public safety. How would you change? the way business is being done now, because I think one of the things we haven't hit upon, right, is how business will change. How will the business of public safety change? How will they do things? But how would you like to see things five years from now, if you could be the Gene Roddenberry, if you're our Captain Kirk, and Rick is your Spock, how would we, how would we do this? Well, um, 
Wow. What would it look like? Captain Can Kirk. I be Scotty? Okay. Um, Scotty. Sorry. <laughs> Well, I, I think Scottish this, this nationwide public safety broadband network would meet all of public safety's needs, first and foremost. Now we can go into some specifics. It would be nice if we didn't have a bunch of systems of systems out there, and instead of buying units in the thousands, we bought them in the millions. Uh, talk about your economy of scale. It would be nice when public safety went around the country. They could communicate like we do and roam instantly onto another system once all of those procedures have been worked out. We don't think about it when we travel with our cell phones. Public safety, if they go out of a certain county, they can't communicate because it's on a different system and it's proprietary and it doesn't work with what they have. That's what public safety has been encountering. Uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about these great technologies, about uh, Facebook, Twitter, but the fact is most of our 911 centers in the nation can't even accept text messages right now. So public safety is way behind as far as the technology goes. And so there's a, there's a great opportunity to transition mission critical data. I mean, can you imagine? You're a fire chief. We'll, we'll go with the fire example. And you're in Chicago. And there's a high rise. And there's a fire. And using some of this data on this system, you could wirelessly outside of the building know what floor the fire is on, what chemicals could be stored on that floor. I mean, there's all kinds of aspects that this could, could meet. But first and foremost, I think we just need to get out of the system of everybody doing their own thing. And we've worked, reverse engineered it, um, you know, from what public safety has done with the land mobile radio uh, world, where uh, you, you have all these fixes on the back end to try to establish communications. We've got a once-in-a-generation opportunity here to build a nationwide network and do it all together. We cannot let this slip through our hands. We just can't. We can't afford to do that. So I want to springboard off something you just said because this goes to what you talked about, augmented reality. I was even thinking when you're saying that how cool it would be to show up and now with your device. Not only do you have that information, but now when I scan my device on the building, I see the floor. I can now get geospatial orientation of exactly where the alarm's coming from or how far out it might spread, right? We start thinking that's changing the business, which leads me into a great question. Notice how I segue this? This is great because well we very have an email question in. Smooth. Because remember when I talked about the business of public safety? If, if I tried to go and change the 60-year-olds that are in public safety right now and say, you're going to have to use Twitter, and you're gonna, I mean, there's a lot of pushback. It's just cultural. We understand that, right? But here's, a, here's a, actually a very good question, uh, and this is going to get some of what you were talking about, Bronwyn. What are the training needs of public safety uh, that are required to support the use of these capabilities once the network is available, social media, mm -hmm. geospatial technology. So let's kind of Can I kick start off with that one? Well, of or course, you're from DHS. You'll, you'll get me well, in trouble. Well, no, no. One, no one, of the first, one of the things I, I was going to say also is you, with new technology, you have to train. Devices and capabilities are no good if you don't know how to use them. So you have to train, you have to have standard operating procedures, uh, and you have to actually have to use the devices. Public safety uh, in the past has went out and bought gadgets, put them away, didn't train on them, didn't use them, and in a disaster tried to pull He's them out and break glass and, and they don't know how to yeah, use and, them. And, and so it, training is essential to any new technology and with this, these technologies it's going to be very critical because when you want to start putting uh, these new technologies in the hands of first responders in life or death situations, they've got to know how to use it, there has to be no hesitation, and they have to use these technologies on a daily basis it's not something you want to put away and then just use in a scenario. So I just wanted to say that to start off with. Well, and, and actually, let, let me let me follow up. Because I was going to jump in. I've got an interesting <laughs> follow-up. But, but, but what I'm saying, but this is the follow-up I was getting to. What I was just saying, right, we can train them on it, right? But, but where does the training come for the executives of the agencies and the agencies themselves to show them how to integrate Twitter into their – how do I integrate Twitter into my computer-aided dispatch or into my emergency call center, right? I think there are some very key issues – we talk about training people, right? But what about training agencies and businesses from a business standpoint, right? So I'm sorry, Rick, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, Chris made a really compelling point about training. And, and again, from the fire perspective, w I'll tell you something interesting that, that we're working on. And it touches on that cultural issue that you mentioned, Morgan, which is you've got senior leaders who have been doing it for an awfully long time. I know fire chiefs who think, you know, electric pencil sharpeners are newfangled, right? They're, they're anchored in a certain view of the world, but we start to see some fire chiefs still, uh, even of the generation, uh, looking for new technologies to, to enable training. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned training because the, 
the idea is you have to do this over and over and over and over and over. You have to build the muscle memory in as a first responder, especially if you're going to make sort of a sea change in the technology that you're using on the fire ground. You know, when you were talking about, I want to see that building, I said, no, I want to see that building on a heads-up display on my mask. That's what I, like, I, that's what I want to see when, when, we, when we talk about those. To get from here to there, or even with that, you have to train, 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 train. What I want to highlight is just something interesting we're, we're, we're doing with a partner, and it starts to touch some of the other folks here as, as well, which is um, it's expensive to do fire training. So to take a station full of firefighters, you can't burn things down. Okay, you'd like to, and occasionally you can. It's a long permitting process. But nothing is the same as having, there's a building on fire, what do we do? Right? You can do it with dry hose and a, and a notional building on fire. But you're always looking for ways to recreate the environment right, to, for them to train. And so the thing I want to flag, because it touches something that Chris said, is we're starting to see people use technology that is, was designed for one thing and used in a completely different way. And the, the example I'll cite is... Uh, is a, is a company called High Voltage Software. So if you haven't heard of High Voltage Software, they're a game designer, right? They make computer games. They've been around for 20 years, right? Now they make, I'd say, probably they make Xbox games, but they make everybody's platform games. But they took a really interesting point on public safety and about first responders, which is, why don't we leverage the skills that the new generation coming in has, the way they see the world, and they start to blur what's play and what's work. So they took their 20 years of game design and, and their, I would say, their first-person shooter game experience, and they turned it into a training solution, a simulation solution for firefighters. Said, okay, when you're playing the game, it's an Xbox controller connected to your computer, uh, your point of view is you as one firefighter, you as a company officer, you as, as an incident commander, and now you can start to do things like, let's play with the town next door. Let's run simulation after simulation, one after another after another, do the after action, do all those kinds of things. So you can break down the walls of what is technology used for? Xbox, my kid plays it in the basement. No, 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 we pull that out, gaming, and we say gaming is now one of those levers that we can pull when we say, how do we bring in a new generation of technology? First, we make the cultural jump. Because when you show this to, you sort of do the over-under on age, a certain age of firefighters goes, got it, and their thumbs are smoking, they're going so fast, right? How do we leverage that generational shift with people who are going to embrace this as a way and use it as a way to get from technology today to all of the new things that we can do once we start to get this, this, this high-speed fabric in the background? Because we can put it up but we still have to w find a way to be able to train them in a way that makes sense to them and then do it a hundred times before they go home that so day. Anybody here with the Navy? Been in the Navy? Seen the Navy? Okay. Uh, there's a game right now the Navy has put out, to your point, and it, it's, it's about submarine warfare. Now, do you think the Navy really puts out a game on submarine warfare because they think it's a cool game? What they did is they put it out there and they're watching all their online community. You know what they're finding out? Is they're developing tactics their expert submarine commanders had not even thought of yet. They're crowdsourcing strategy right. through online gaming using this because they don't come with the preconceived notions that, well, I'm only supposed to attack a fire this way. I'm only supposed to, mm -hmm. you know, track a bad guy this way. Kind of leads me to you, Bronwyn, because you kind of represent for Esri, which for a while was considered a lot of great products. And, you know, we talk, we both know Lou Nelson, but kind of for a long time was kind of like, it was all the old guys, you know, it was all the guys that came out of public safety and stuff, but you're kind of bringing this social media aspect. What do you see from an Esri standpoint? Uh, you know, how would the world look five years from now if you could converge the way you wanted to, social media with GIS and geospatial? You know, what would your product set look like? What would things change? How would it be div delivered differently than it is today? Um, so I'm going to say almost not at all. Okay, I know that's not really the answer that you want, but social media for us at Esri in a geospatial, you know, in the geospatial community is not something that we want to make unique. We don't want geosocial, we don't want to build a product around geosocial and make it this, you know, this unique entity. Uh, we want to treat geosocial just like any other data source to GIS, just like um, you need imagery, you need before and after imagery, you need a road network, you need uh, you know, points of interest database, you need, uh, you know, you need those sensors to know when there's a chemical spill. Geosocial, exactly the same, just another data source to GIS. Um, that's 
No, that's that's fine. It's there's no answer implied, but I think that's the important point, right? Is too many people get wrapped around. They think Twitter's a next great thing, right? As opposed to truly what it is. It's a, it's a source of geo spatial data, right? It happens to be in a social media environment. So I, I do maybe have one. It, one thing that I think does make it a little bit different is that there is so much of it. <laughs> and I know I said this earlier with the big data deal, but um, we're doing a little project right now with our business partner, GNIP, G-N-I-P, who um, they're a, essentially a, a reseller of Twitter. And we have connected to a, a stream of all of the geo tweets coming in for 30 days is what we're gonna do. And we're gonna try and store it in our spatial data. Um, bring it in to the Esri, uh, Esri system and store it so we can do some analysis. Uh, we did a couple day little trial period. We kind of knew, kind of knew how much data we'd be getting. We were not even close. It was so much data, more than you know I had ever personally dealt with. I know in the military, you know, with live tracking feeds, they are used to dealing with this, kind, this quantity of information, but just, uh, I think that is the one thing that, that is going to make it, you know, a little bit unique for as a data source at GIS is that there's so much of it and it's very dynamic. It's always changing, you know. Um, Twitter is not tied to any sort of defined schema. And I, I know I keep using Twitter as an example. Obviously, it's not the only social network out there. Uh, it's something that we use frequently in the United States, North America. Uh, there are, you know, other social networks that are used far more broadly around the world to, you know, Japan, the is a social network called Mixty, or Mixy. And anyway, I apologize for keeping, keeping using Twitter, but um, I don't remember what I was saying now. Oh, so, that they're not, they're not tied to any, that they're not tied to any kind of well-known uh, schema like we have with, you know, uh, you know, when we collect imagery from this, satellite, we know what the signature of that is. Well, there's no structured way citizens respond to things and put information in. They just, it's exactly. stream of consciousness. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. So. so, Bill, now for you. You're former law enforcement, right? San Diego. Great place. Coronado Island's a great place, too. Yeah. You've been at Qualcomm quite a while. You've seen a lot of change. You've seen a lot of innovation happen, right? So, again, I, I make you, <coughs> Captain Kirk. You, you've got control now five years from now. You get to have what you want. What what would you like to see as a former law enforcement practitioner, but being close to this, what would you like to see as the types of technology, the types of innovation you, you would like to drive, not only personally from a company standpoint, but for the folks you used to work with, what would you like to see these folks have, you know, five years from now? Sure. Um, let me just go back to the training real quick, because from a, San Diego is the eighth, large, eighth largest city uh, in the country, and for me to put guys through our training cycle was 18 months. So... The reality is there. For, I mean, you can do it, but it, you can't do it and do it and do it. It's 18 months to get just one group of, of officers through that training cycle. So there's some challenges there. One of the things you can do, though, is, is put it in their day-to-day -day lives. I spent a ton of money on some really cool software once, half a million dollars, best thing I'd ever seen, greatest technology. We trained and trained everybody on it, and we didn't use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the disaster happened, we did just what you said. It, everybody went right back to cards and handing cards around because we didn't use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Could have used that same software every day for our daily log. But we were naive and we didn't start implementing it. So whatever these technologies are, let's build it in to the officers, the firefighters, right. daily life. They know how to use a cell phone. Um, what are they doing every day on their, on their MDTs or MCTs that they have in their car? Let's push that out to the mobile environment. Now let's start putting the add-ons to it to get more to where Morgan was headed. Let's make every, every police car, every fire car a node. Let's put a femto cell in it so that we have our ad hoc network already built up five years from now so that we have peer-to-peer -peer capabilities on that. Let's push those radio systems into VoIP. Um, actually, I saw a kid that did this. He wanted to talk on his ham radio on his cell phone. So he built a little box hooked his radio to it, hooked his radio to his laptop, took his cell phone, put an application on it, and I was sitting with him in Las Vegas at a convention, and his phone was in some, I think it was in Alabama somewhere, or his, his radio was in Alabama, and he goes, watch this. And he starts talking on his ham radio from his cell phone and hearing back. I said, that's pretty cool. You think you could do that for public safety? And he said, oh, yeah. He goes, look. And he pulls up an applica same application with a different, different node on it, 
and it was some police department somewhere else in the country. He goes, that's such and such police department. It's already done. And so he was using his cell phone as a radio, talking over uh, the whatever it was, 7, 800, 900, whatever frequency, whatever network it was, just by taking it and making a VoIP application. So bring those daily things that police officers need, firefighters need, and then start adding on to it. Um, those were, and by the way, I asked the guy how much a box was. He said $1,000. He said, I'll give you the app for free. I thought, God, we should all do that. Every, every, every cell phone then becomes a, a, a radio. Yeah, it becomes a push-to-talk device. It was a push-to-talk yeah. device. Yeah. Uh, and you know, probably needed to, to buffer it up and build it up a little bit and strengthen it. But those are out there right now. So, um, and then start adding the applications onto, the, onto whatever device you're using, whether it be a cell phone, a pad, or whatever else, to start reaching out into the disaster area. So now you've got peer-to-peer -peer going. Um, I want to find out where that person is sitting in, in the... Uh, uh, in the disaster that's out there. I want to find where my victims are. What can I do? What type of uh, uh, location-based services can I do? What kind of triangulation can I do? I mean, it's just the, we're limited by our imagination. And let some of these bright kids that are dealing with it every single day get into a room and say, this is what I'm faced with. Um, the idea, the example I gave you of the helicopter with the forward-looking infrared pushing that downlink uh, into the police car, that's true. That's done today. Let's push it out to the cell phones. The, but the reason it's done today is because some kids said, you know what, you know, I was in the military. We had forward-looking infrared. Why don't we have it here? And then another kid sat there and said, well, why don't we push it to the police car? So we pushed it to the police car. And once it gets to the police car, then we could push it everywhere. So now all of a sudden you've got forward-looking infrared data that could only be seen by the helicopter pilots now going to everyone. And he did that with 50 bucks and a trip to Radio Shack and solved, yeah, he well, didn't let... He didn't let bureaucracy get in the way of didn't solving the problem. He didn't let bureaucracy get in the way of it. And so those are ideas that, that are out there. It's a matter of getting these users and technologists together um, with decision makers and saying, this is what we want, and then taking a swipe and doing it. And, and we're going to try ten things, and five of them are going to be successful. Um, and we're going to have to throw five away and celebrate the guys that we those ideas that we threw away and bring those guys back in and say, come up with five more, because that's going to give us, uh, you know, another ten ideas. And the, the more we do that, the more we're going to see the, this, the stuff that's sitting out there today, Facebook. Look at what Facebook's done um, in the world today. Uh, internationally, the changes that that kid made, the guy sitting, a bunch of kids sitting in, in, a, in a dorm room one night putting Facebook together. Twitter, same thing. I mean, all those are, are creative ideas that, that uh, people getting together and just brainstorming and, and putting those together and letting them, letting them pro proliferate into the world. Hey, real quick, let me just, we have a quick email question. Uh, somebody's listening. Um, they said, we've heard about partnerships, interoperability, and economies of scale. We've announced partnerships for public safety and LTE between, for example, Verizon and Motorola, AT&T and Harris, and, and two of those, those gentlemen happen to be in the room today, So, and our customers, too. I have to shout out and suck up because they pay our bills. Um, while many smaller, and as opposed to others, while many smaller and regional carriers are also looking at how they can work with public safety. But in terms of spectrum, each of these is in a different band class, including public safety. How do we solve these concerns and ensure interoperability? So I, I wanted to take a quick pass at that since that's kind of what I do. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you, one thing I want to say is that it's because public safety finally decided to leverage commercial economies of scale, leverage commercial technology, and not build their own things. Let me tell you what that's resulted in. For example, uh, Verizon's launched their network. AT&T's launching their network. They talk about how will we interoperate because Verizon's band 13, uh, AT&T's band 17, public safety's band 14. So for public safety, I mean, one thing I'm, I'm proud to announce, we, we announced this last week, but we've done now the first multi-device interoperability on a, on a public safety network with two devices from separate manufacturers, separate chipsets, before the first LTE network is fully up and running and deployed. That's not, that's, if you think about P25 and LMR, we're still struggling to achieve that, you know, since October 89 when P25 was announced as APCO 25 with TIA, right? So I'm excited just from that standpoint. So how do we assure interoperability? Well, let me tell you. One of the ways is the partnership, I think. It's the partnership between DHS, between Verizon, between AT&T, between Sprint, between T-Mobile, between our regional carriers, between our other telecommunications, to make sure that we adhere to standards. I think the way you solve this is through standards. If everybody have to have a different adapter for their plug, even though we're all in the United States, you drive you crazy. But it's a standard plug. It's a standard interface. It's a standard 110 outlet. Imagine what would happen if everything was different every time you went someplace. I was in Pakistan. I could get a phone call on my phone in Pakistan of all places, Islamabad. Why? 
because carriers and the commercial environment, consumers have demanded that these things work together. The carriers have listened. The people who make the equipment have listened. So why doesn't public safety have that same voice? So when you say, how do we solve these concerns in ensure interoperability? I think it's standards. I think it's this partnership between government, between industry, between carriers, between everybody that says, and to your point, Chris, and I've heard Chief Moore, Chief Dowd, all these guys say this, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We, we can't afford to screw this up. So I think it gets done because enough people realize this is our one shot to get this right because we've got to live with this forever. So I think it's the standards. I think it's the leveraging of LTE technology commercially. And I think it took public safety coming out of the Public Safety Alliance and folks to say, LTE is our technology of choice. We're focusing on this now. Everybody get behind this. And our last great hurdle is legislatively is ensuring that D block gets allocated to public safety. If those things come together, I think you will see something we've been struggling with for years, decades, is to truly create that environment to where we can bring the public sector innovation, the right investment from government, the right partnership, you know, all these tools out there and create a true environment. So that, that's kind of my quick spiel on that. So actually we have some uh, time. Now we're kind of into the open freestyling section too. So your panel's at your disposal. I know we have folks uh, uh, on the web and I know we're getting some email questions. So you see that up there, it's questions at publicsafetygis.org or come in over Twitter at uh, hashtag ecoms. So let me turn this open to the folks here. Anybody here have a question for our esteemed panel? We, yes, sir. Hi, I'm Mike Russell. I'm a member of Crisis uh, Commons and also InfraGuard, uh, two public-private partnerships you're probably familiar with. I wondered if one of the panelists might want to speak to any specific success stories uh, that any of you have had in, in terms of collaboration with groups like Crisis Commons, who are now uh, closely affiliated with uh, the Wilson Center here, or groups like InfraGuard, which is somewhat less well-known, that is a uh, public-private uh, partnership for infrastructure safety and security. Yeah, between the FBI and uh, critical infrastructure yes. folks, right. Yes, so anybody have a story for that? I mean, I have some anecdotes, but... So let me throw out one. I'll tell you, you mentioned critical infrastructure. PDD 63, President Clinton originally came out with Presidential Decision Directive 63 identifying the critical infrastructures. And that has grown over time. But I'll tell you, to, to FBI's credit as well, it used to be, uh, I'm from the FBI, I'm here to help and put out the press release. You know, we used to joke. But these guys have really become partners in this because they have to because there's only uh, 12,000 FBI agents and 800,000 local law enforcement. They, had, they figured out they had to partner. So InfraGuard is one of the key ways where they brought together uh, private sector, uh, public safety, federal government to address common issues. And if you guys have heard of the ISACs, the Information Sharing Analysis Centers, the financial sector was one of the first people to put the ISAC together to share information. And let me tell you what that, what that uh, kind of a spin-off of InfraGuard, but InfraGuard people were part of that. It's because of through that they actually identified the first DDoS attack uh, that came out, the denial of service attack that hit Yahoo and Amazon and came out uh, in uh, 2001. Yeah, February of 2001. A lot of that information came from logs that financial institutions shared back with public safety. Because I know, because I was sharing this information with a friend of mine who was an FBI special agent over in the uh, Critical Infrastructure Threat Assessment Center, the CTAC, over at FBI. So, I mean, so even going back 10 years, they saw the nature of how they needed to collaborate. And I think InfraGuard has been a good way to share information and bring people regionally, make it local. All politics is local. Well, all terrorism is local. All crime is local at the end of the day. How do we bring people together? So, I mean, I've seen that uh, happen a lot just through the different groups from around the region. And InfraGuard has a national meeting as well. So, I mean, anybody else have anything? Or some, uh, Chris, I know you guys run all sorts of groups uh, beyond InfraGuard, but I want to give credit to DHS and some of their groups and your work with other law enforcement. And well, a, a, lot of, a lot of the federal agencies, um, I wanted to say earlier, uh, it's not just DHS. I mean, we're partnering with our federal partners at Commerce and Justice and all the other federal agencies, and we're really aligned doing a lot in this space as a federal government. Um, well, I, I could talk about some of my the experiences I had in Virginia partnering with industry, uh, you know, to, to bring to bear uh, solutions in uh, bad situations. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, public safety themselves that restored communications after the Virginia Tech shootings when all the comms went down because every parent called in. It was our partners from industry that came in and said, hold on, uh, Virginia Emergency Operations Center, we're ready to deploy, let's go, let's go restore these communications. And so there's, there's tons of stories like that uh, where industry, and uh, groups are working with public safety to bring to bear all the tools. Just today, we have more tools than we've ever had before. It's fascinating. I mean, I was hoping someone might ask the question, what's going to be invented five years from now that's going to make all this stuff look old? 
because that's you had how your chance, <laughs> Captain Kirk. I gave you that. Yeah. <laughs> the tricorder. But yeah, so that's just one example. I mean, there are so many things public safety can't solve on their own, and they need our industry partners uh, to step up, and, and they are stepping up in a team atmosphere to say, hey, I can do this. I think one of the challenges is getting public safety to realize what's at their fingertips and bringing them together. So it's funny, I, I heard the panelist answer. I, we've got the safe comp continuum that says in today's environment or in tomorrow's environment, there are five things you got to do to achieve interoperability. You got to have standard operating procedures. I heard someone say that. You got to have usage. You got to use whatever you're using. Training and exercises. Got to do it no matter what you're using. Governance. And then technology. Notice technology is only 20% of that equation. It's one out of five. You've got to have it all working together. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, it, it dawned on me that continuum is going to last for the next 20 or 30 years because it, it's, it's almost technology neutral in a way because you've got all the other things. It doesn't matter what the technology is. We're going to be faced with the same problems. And unless we solve these same problems, it doesn't matter if it's the next silver bullet. We're still going to have In fact, these. they're going to be more complex as the technologies yes. become more complex because, as you alerted, alluded to, the training is going to be, I mean, a lot more than you used to have. I mean, we used to think LMR training was difficult, learning different codes and things of that nature and how to turn the knobs on a radio. In this environment, it's going to be a lot more intensive. Right. So uh, some more questions from the uh, – yes, sir. Oh, wait a second. Let him give you the microphone here if you'd identify yourself, too. I'm Joe Marks from NextGov. Uh, I'm wondering how some of the things you talked about could be applicable in international disaster responses in places where there is – less broadband, a different kind of spectrum, and often not the same kind of or the same quality of mapping data. Um, Bill? Well, I can, in a disaster situation, I can give you a couple of examples during um, uh, uh, a couple of disasters here. Well, I'll start off with Katrina. Uh, we brought in a, a broadband base station and started handing out cell phones to everybody. Um, we've done that internationally. We actually gave one of those base stations uh, um, to one of the international authorities so that it can be deployed in those types of situations. So you can bring the capabilities to there if they're not currently present uh, in a disaster situation. Uh, you, you saw some of my numbers about 9 billion devices out there. You've got 5 billion cell phones out there right now that have capabilities. Slower data rates in different parts of the world. Um, but the networks are there to start pushing out applications to do some semblance of this. Maybe it's slower. Um, you know, the, the pipe doesn't move as many bits as fast as it does, but maybe a picture as opposed to a motion picture uh, is good enough for, for those environments. So there's a lot of ways I, I think these capabilities are either there or uh, can be enhanced in, in times of disaster. Uh, to bring, uh, share these resources that we have or we may have in the future uh, fairly readily. I mean, you can see just the numbers of these things and these devices. That's why Qualcomm's successful. That's why a lot of us in this room that are from the company side are, are successful because it just keeps growing and it keeps getting faster and better out there. And, and part of it is in the U.S., we're, we don't have a, a you know, monopoly on the uh, inability to cooperate well, you know, right? So it's not just a technology issue overseas. It's, the, it's, a, it's a policy and it's a partnership issue. Um, Earthquakes in Haiti aren't by their nature worse than earthquakes in Chile. Um, but when you don't have building codes and you don't have different standards in place and you don't have uh, the daily use of, say, geospatial technology like you do in, in, in places like Chile, it, the earthquake is worse. It, it has nothing to do with the technology or the geography. It has to do with how those partnerships are formed, how well they're used. Are they done daily? Are you trained on them? It's the continuum. And it's not a, the continuum is not a U.S.-specific concept. It can be translated into any language and it'll be equally useful. And have the relationship in place to bring in, you know, as Bill said, you know, bring in that, that mobile node, you know, the giant truck or an organization like NetHope that came into Haiti as an example and said, okay, you know, this is all going to work when we have broadband, so put the tower up and started to put up a few layers of, you know, sort of of the comm network in order to enable a lot of the solutions that they needed to basically just run the government at a, at a very core level. So um, there may not always be the infrastructure you need. The key is ahead of time making the right relationships and partnerships to be able to bring that kind of capability in in times of disaster. I'd like to just uh, speak, to, speak to your mapping question, your mapping comment as well, that Haiti is now the 
has the best mapped road network of any third world country. I think most <laughs> of us probably know that. And that is, uh, that was kind of done independent of the infrastructure that was in Haiti at the time, right? That was done by people outside of right. the country, um, working through um, Yushahidi, working through OpenStreetMap, and tapping into the volunteer network um, outside of the country itself, and I don't, I don't think that needs to go unrecognized. And interesting to to speak to Haiti. I mean, uh, Fairfax, uh, the USAR team went yep, there, yep. Mm -hmm. and an interesting uh, thing that they learned is uh, once the system went down, they went in and the comms were brought back up. Then you get days later all of these tweets saying, "I'm here, I'm there," right. uh, and and so they're actually going to these coordinates on rescue missions and unfortunately in most cases it was days later and it was too late but it's an interesting reminder about how folks just assume when they have their device that it's they, they, they assume the infrastructure is going to be there and they're calling for help on these new technologies and that's and, one and of we the have to realize that I talked to the deputy chief I was out at the um, uh, uh, fire planners conference out in Portland I actually sat next to the guy who ran that uh, division for Fairfax so one of only two units in the US that gets USAID support to actually fly out to these places they actually bring their comm system with them but we had that discussion as some of the technology that's needed right is even though the towers not up there these cell phones are still beaconing right so how can you come in geospatial overlay technology so you see where these phones are beaconing from and make sure that you cover off on each one of those mm -hmm. hey we got time I think for one more question yes sir down at the end there um, Let's get you a microphone first, because you will be on live TV. Millions of people are watching, <laughs> I think, on the web. At least four. Four million. You had two questions, right? So at least two. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, my name is Steve Birnbaum. I'm the lead for humanitarian assistance disaster response with the Global VSAT Forum, represents the satellite industry. Um, I'm also on um, the uh, ACICIP Disaster Response Committee with Harmony, your colleague. Sure. Um, so I, I, I definitely get the technology side, and I would love to see some of this, but I also wear another hat. I'm a volunteer firefighter in a, one of the larger accommodation departments um, uh, here in the area. And the fact of the matter is, even with the bandwidth we have today, we're limited by application. Um, we can't bring up the bird's eye view on Bing Maps on our MDCs, and it's not a bandwidth limit. The apps look like circa uh, late 1990s. So... And I also read the news with all the firefighter layoffs uh, around the country, some of the lack of training, the older gear, um, as much as I would love to have some of these tools and the heads up and, and it's just such an awesome thing to be able to, to see a building layout um, on a heads up on my face piece, if we had to choose and with the budget situation the way it is, it may come down to a choice, is this the most effective safety effort that we should be doing a a and it hurts me to ask the question but is this is this a better initiative than training or heart going back to four-person staffing on engines or some of the other things that are getting cut all over the country so let me throw out one because okay. i know you want to talk and it's something near near to my heart too because the old thing was if you put a cop on every street corner could you stop crime right well when i talked to chief chris moore when he took over san jose pd from uh, rob davis First, his first uh, act of duty was he had to cut 250 officers, and their department was only 1,200, 1,300 to begin with, right? Some of the same challenges. What it, we're just, it's a tough decision to make, and as a commander, you, one of your toughest decisions is who do I lay off, what's the impact? And so there is, I don't think there's an either-or question, or I don't think you do one or the other, but I think we've got to get better at understanding how do we deliberately apply technology. Maybe I can't have four people staff an engine, but could I have three if I understood and, and we invested in the right technology? Technology doesn't require overtime. It doesn't require training, but it requires you to be trained on it. I'm not saying technology is the silver bullet either, but I, that gets back to my whole question about I think we're reaching a point not only with the technology but with the economic times and, and the budget issues. We're reaching a point where we have to fundamentally go back and look at how do we do, how do we, how do, we do policing, how do we do firefighting when they introduce the car? That changed policing for uh, Sir Robert Peel, uh, the father of modern policing in London. It, it was Bobby's walking the beat. Well, when you introduced the car, it changed everything. When you introduced the radio, it changed everything. In fact, if uh, you guys are on, you see everybody's seen Taser. They've seen, you know, you know, you've, they've seen the stun gun, right? But if somebody who's in law enforcement, 
when we saw that come along, that changed our training, that changed our use of force continuum, that changed our risk, that changed our policies. It was a fundamental business change. If I wanted to deploy a technology, I had to change so many things behind it, not just throw it on somebody's hip and hope that they used it well. Is it gun side? Is it draw side? You know, what do I do? So, I mean, let me, you, you have some insight on the fire well, side. Well, and too. I'm so glad you asked that question because it, it really highlights this issue that says we can do all this cutting edge stuff and, you know, they make fabulous PowerPoint slides, right, you know, to put all this stuff together. What we always have to keep our eye on is who ultimately is going to consume the information, how do they need to get it, what format, and in some ways what decision and device are they going to be using when, the, when they do this. And I think what, what you got to, and it's really important, is this idea, we sometimes say it's, it's firefighter ready and firefighter proof. Right? So it's got to be ready to use. And sometimes you get devices brought out to you. You want to try this out. And you say, can I use it with my gloves on? No. Okay, well, out it goes. Right? So it's got to be done in a way that you on the fire ground don't just get a map. Hey, here's the building. But it's delivered to you in a way that makes, lets you make decisions, that it's easy to use and easy to consume. And it's also incredibly rugged because, and I don't just mean this for firefighters, any of the users, law enforcement, any of the users are going to consume this. They have to get it in the form factor that makes sense too because the, the other joke that we talk about is if you take a firefighter and you lock him or her in a room with two bowling balls and you come back in a half an hour, one will be missing and the other will be broken. Right. This is this is the this is the world. Well, I thought you were talking about 220 years of uh, service uh, unimpeded by, by progress. By progress, right? exactly. <laughs> but it highlights this idea that says if we're going to provide this information, law enforcement, any sort of first responder, the the people behind the scenes doing the analysis to prevent events from happening in the first place, we can't say here's a map, use it. You've got to do so much what Esri does, which says, who are you? What are you going to use it for? What's the decision you're going to make? How do we pipe exactly the right data to you? And I would say on a device and at the right moment in the right format so you can use it, take it, not break it, and make good decisions and, and, and increase your operational effectiveness. Just pumping you a map isn't right. going to change the way you work, but we don't always look at that step in the process to say, we got it, it's, it's on a slide. No, how do we make it real for the people who are going to consume so it? We're going to finish up with Chris had a remark and then we're going to close because we want to be respectful of time because some of us have planes. <clears throat> well, I was just going to say, uh, it, it's an excellent question. These are tough budget times. But one of the things uh, that's the catalyst behind this is not just the new technology and new capabilities. We're talking about saving public safety a lot of money in the long run by moving from $5,000 per radio to something a lot less because we're buying millions at once versus a few thousand here and there. Those types of things. So if you look at the economies of scale of this, it, it's amazing. If, if public safety can partner with, with private industry and we can ride this wave of all those users, uh, it, it'll be fantastic. But I will just throw out one caveat. It's got to meet public safety's needs. You know that. I mean, if you depend, and, and the panelists know that, if you're going to put that in your hands and you're going to depend upon it for life or death situations, it's got to meet public safety's needs. That's going to take a little time to work out, but we've got to partner. We've got to do what we're doing in this room today to get there, and I think everybody's willing to do it. So it was a great question, uh, but I, I, we, uh, the administration believes that over time there's going to be economies of scale that public safety could never dream of because we're not buying together. We're not working together like a nationwide network word with a governance that's going to work together and procure potentially millions of devices at once. That will drive down costs drastically across the board. It'll probably help volunteer firefighters, too, get equipment that they've so coveted. Uh, because from my experience traveling the country, volunteer firefighters, they're doing bake sales and stuff to buy radios, and, 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 that, and that's just a crime. We can't have that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're going to wrap here, but to your point, the thing I've heard from everybody, they, a lot of folks in public safety don't care what the technology is. They say it just has to work. Mm -hmm. that, that the bottom line, it just has to work. So I think that's a good way to wrap it. Just, and I think this has worked very well, so I want to thank our panelists here today for their time. So give them a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> and, Peter, I turn it over to you for the close, sir. Uh, I want to thank everyone who tuned in um, uh, on the online uh, streaming and thank everyone who participated here. On behalf of the NAPSIG Foundation, I want to thank the board members for their time and, and for um, uh, the effort they put into making this an informational and useful um, uh, session. Leah, I'd like to ask if you'd like to close us on anything in particular? Yeah, I would like to thank our director, Jane Harmon, our esteemed panelists. Thank you for, for coming all this way to uh, participate in this event. I'd like to thank Director Essid and uh, DHS Office of Emergency Communications and 
Alex and Rebecca, whose brainchild this was. Uh, I'd like to thank the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, particularly Rebecca Harned, their program director, who without her hard work, um, this would not have been the success that it was. And to all of you for participating in this event. Uh, we do have another event scheduled for the morning of November 10th on social media for emer in emergency response, transforming the response enterprise. Uh, I welcome, it's going to be free and open to all. So, th And you can uh, check the Wilson Center website, wilsoncenter.org, for more information. Thank you. <laughs>